Hi, Mike Giannotti back here, and uh, today uh, for this reading, we're going to go ahead and we will be reading. I've got glasses all over here, reading glasses. Da, 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 da. We're going to be reading chapter one from my dad's unpublished book. It was just written for myself and my sisters, Mary and Laura, and uh, we're going to start into chapter one, and yeah, let's just dig in. The sight of Garibaldi Park, or the corner, gave me a wonderful sense of belonging and security. Coming out of my hallway onto Shaw Street and looking up the street over at the park or the corner, I knew somebody would be around to talk, play, or just hang around. We all felt that sanctuary was in Garibaldi Park or the corner. Close friendships were formed, and we would protect our brothers and sisters, and that's in quotations, and our brothers and sisters from any problems that might arise. I know it would take several volumes to describe the families and friends living in the neighborhood. Each and every one of the three separate age groups I mentioned had distinct and interesting personalities. Assimilation was gradual for the newcomers from Italy. The neighborhood derived a belonging to old country, customs and mutual needs for a sense of security. Many of the parents had not full command of the English language or spoke little English. I used to ask my dad because uh, my grandpa would not teach him Italian, would not speak to him at Italian. He learned it from his aunts and uncles. And uh, I remember asking him, I was like, Dad, well, what the heck did he used to say? Because grandpa, you know, for me growing up, he spoke only English to us. Um, but... Uh, uh, I said, what did he say? He could barely speak English as it is. And he said, he'd tell us, you know, you win by 10 or I lock at the door. You eat your food or I make it the blood from a you know. <laughs> simple, simple phrases, but uh, important, right? So, yeah, that was part of his growing up. So, at any rate, um, going back here. Also, an inequality of status citywide made dependency upon one another important. Neighbors and friends were practically considered family. Respect for elders was unquestionable. Any insult or wrongdoing could result in punishment from relatives, friends, and even neighbors. <laughs> we could use some of that these days. Disrespect brought immediate punishment. Should one's family become aware of the disrespect, it brought on further punishment from the family. You prayed your never your family never found out about your infraction. Firstborn Americans were fiercely proud of their heritage and culture, and my dad was the firstborn. Tradition was preserved from their places of origin and practiced in their new country. Religion, language, foods, and family practices were vigorously adhered to in their new environment. An affront to one member was a personal insult to the entire group, and retaliation was certain, particularly with the younger groups residing in the community. The corner consisted of three groups that associated or hung around together. There were the big guys that ranged from 18 to 22 years old, whom were your role models. Next was the group of 14 to 17 year olds. The third group was mainly elementary grade students ranging from 8 to 13 years of age. I can honestly say that no one in our neighborhood ever caused, <clears throat> excuse me, caused harm, wanton destruction, or exhibited serious criminal behavior. Gambling and fighting were major infractions. We could fight among ourselves and our intergroups. We little guys made sure we were always outnumbered the older group ahead of us in a rough and tumble. We never sassed or fought the big guys. The big guys had very little association with the younger two groups other than as disciplinarians or guardians. Their social life was quite different and their role set the tone for the younger groups. Most were older brothers, uncles, cousins, or just close neighbors. The friction that resulted between the middle and younger groups. This was in the form of athletic competition or roughhousing. All three groups, except for a few, were first-generation Americans 
with strong familial ties to the old country. Growing up, it was difficult to imagine that we were Italian and also American. Our generation wanted to assimilate with the American culture, but community and family ties made us also protective of our Italian heritage. There were definite distinctions between us and them. Other ethnic, other ethnic communities existed within the city in segregated locations because of nationalities. Little animosity was shown between the ethnic groups. Friends were made at school and competitive functions. We just felt our culture and way of doing things were better as I'm sure the other ethnic groups felt the same. Little Italy provided all our basic needs. Bakeries, meat markets, fish markets, fruit and vegetable stores, poultry market and grocery stores. To, uh, to us, anyone that ate peanut butter, sliced American cheese or bologna sandwiches between white sliced bread had to be different. Our lunches consisted of cooked bell peppers, sometimes with Italian sausage, eggplant, meatball or grinder, salami, provolone cheese, lettuce, tomato, olive oil, salt, and pepper. <clears throat> of course, these were put inside Italian bread known as grinder bread. Our sandwiches may have been messier to eat, but infinitely tastier. Freddy, the knife and scissors sharpener, would once a month drive his truck down Shaw Street. The back of his truck contained the knife and scissor sharpening wheel. He would park his truck by Garibaldi Park and serenade everyone according oh excuse me and serenade everyone with his accordion. Impromptu dancing and singing would accompany his accordion playing. He was a virtual Pied Piper for the children. When he saw or heard his truck, when we saw or heard his truck, or heard his accordion playing while slowly driving his truck, we would follow it all the way to Garibaldi Park. He would greet us and sometimes sing to us while slowly rolling along. The community could also recognize the voices of the vendors that frequented Shaw Street. Mr. Raspoli, who sold fruits and vegetables from his cart. Remember, all these names are changed uh, in deference to the families. <laughs> Uh, Jumbo, the Iceman, Mr. Levine, the Ragman. The Iceman and the Ragman had horses to pull their wagons. We liked to hang on to the tailboard of those wagons for a ride. Both vendors had whips, but it was difficult for them to hit us on the hands. Jumbo succeeded occasionally when we had to reach over the tail tailboard to grab some pieces of ice. When Jumbo parked his wagon, we scattered. Jumbo was over six feet tall and weighed about 240 pounds. Those of us that managed to get some ice to suck on were the lucky ones. However, we all broke chunks of ice off the sidewalk and shared it with the rest. Jumbo would carry a 50 pound block of ice on his leather shoulder pad and another in his ice tongs while climbing two flights of stairs as easily as you could walk up them. He knew he had to return quickly or we would jump up on his wagon to grab more small pieces of ice. Oftentimes, neighbors and parents would keep us from climbing all over his wagon. They wanted, to assure, they wanted assurance that Jumbo would return to fill their ice boxes during the summer. I think Jumbo would leave small pieces for us. He seemed to like us and even hired some of our group to work for him. It was like a friendly game between him and us. The vendors with a horse and wagon had blinders on the side of the horse's eyes so that they all could see, all they could see was straight ahead. When delivering uh, goods, they would tie a rope on the bit of the horse's mouth with a stone weight that reached the ground. This way, the horse would keep his head straight ahead. Well, Louie had to test this theory. Louie was one of his friends. One day, he whacked the ragman's horse on the rump, and it took off, weight and all, up Shaw Street with the wagon rumbling behind it. A man at the top of Shaw Street caught the horse and held it for the ragman. 
Everyone pleaded ignorance or innocence when questioned by neighbors and older brothers and uncles. This would have resulted in some harsh punishment. Times were tough, and the horse and wagon were the man's livelihood. you got to remember, too, this is back in the Depression, and this is pre... There was no concept of welfare, you know, government uh, assistance, etc. People got along as best they could with what they could. And I, there's some stories that come up here that are pretty crazy uh, as they struggled for food and other things. Um, so like like the kids were talking about, ice was like a, a treasure, right? You get a piece of ice or a piece of fruit. <clears throat> The workers in the neighborhood needed a substantial lunch to sustain them throughout the labors of a long, hard day. The New York Fruit Store, remember that name, owned by my uncle Tony, and gr my great uncle Tony, and great un great uncle uh, Benedict. Uh, the New York Fruit Store under oh, he's got a picture of 1803, the first ice home ice box. <laughs> Under the proprietor proprietorship of Benny, my great uncle Benedict, uh, created a sandwich which was first called an Italian sandwich and eventually the grinder within the neighborhood. And they called it the grinder because the bread, the grinder bread, which you can't get anywhere. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I, I said it. Uh, Subway and all these ones making stuff. They only begin to approach it when they toast it. You didn't have to toast grinder bread. Soft on the inside, crunchy on the outside, and uh, they only sold it that day. Any leftover was used for breadcrumbs, for meatballs, and other stuff. Had to be done, so baked, sold, and used that day. Um, presently, grinders have assumed names such as Hoagie, Subs, Heroes, etc. Uh, Benny's store faced Garibaldi Park in many summer days. Benny could be seen outside the front of the store filling five-cent cups of lemon ice that came in colors of red or white. Uh, one other side note on the grinder, there is a video on YouTube about uh, New London, Connecticut, birthplace of the grinder and all about my uh, uh, uncle's store and all that, so go check it out. The park, as it was called in the neighborhood, became a gathering place to meet, socialize, or for recreation. Across the street from the park, on the corner of Shaw and Bank Street, was Pippi's Bar and Restaurant. My, I called him Uncle Pippi. Um, he was really, I think, my dad's. <laughs> uh, or his might have been his cousin. I, it all gets very confusing. We called everybody uncle who were cousins and uh, just a lot older. This was considered the corner. Whenever people were arranging to meet, they would say, meet you at the corner. Otherwise, for just hanging around, we would go to the park. The park brought the neighborhood into one place. After dinner, the men would sit on benches under the trees on the perimeter of the park and smoke their cigars talking in their native Italian. The women would gather around the New York fruit store on benches and chairs to visit. The children were safe in the confines of the spiked iron fence around Garibaldi Park playing various games. There was no grass in the park, except for weeds along the edge of the fence. Several trees lined the east and west and south end of the park. A horseshoe pit was provided along with some tether, bowl, tether ball poles. Other games played were dodgeball or war. War was played with jackknives that came with our Buster Brown boots. Imagine back then, when they weren't killing each other, you bought a pair of boots, and you got a jackknife. You got a knife with your boots as a kid, right? A square was drawn in the dirt and divided in half. Each person tried to divide the opponent's square by throwing the jackknife into his square. The object of the game was to make their square as small as possible so they could not fit their foot in it. The game called for accuracy in getting the jackknife to stick in the dirt. Baseball and football were played at Namiog School, where there was more room. When darkness came, the men would leave the park and go to the Glory Tavern to play an Italian card game known as Brisca. Each game, the loser had to buy the drinks. 
It was entertaining to watch them from the window playing. They took their time playing each card, muttering in Italian, then slamming the card onto the table. More discussion would ensue until the next man repeated the same scenario. We then would go to the corner of Shaw and Woodbridge Street by the streetlight to play, kick the can, or ring Olivio until it was time to go home. More of those, especially ring Olivio. <laughs> the benches outside the park provided us with unending fascination, watching the electric trolley cars ride the tracks on overhead wires past the park on their way to downtown. We would yell and wave to the people. Fresh baking bread from the three bakeries located within Little Italy, along the markets, backyard vineyards, gardens, and flowers permeated the air. Occasionally a whiff of an Italian Parodi cigar, guinea stinkers as we call them, mingled with other aromas. Neighbors looked out of open windows and greeting you were some of the things that gave me a sense of security and belonging. Some of my most cherished memories were of the picnics during the summertime. A trip to Rocky Neck State to Rocky Neck Beach had food and people jammed into cars th for the rides through the rural areas of Waterford, East Lyme, and Old Lyme to Rocky Neck Beach. The big picnic was held at the Woodland Grave in Waterford, presently Woodland Mobile Park. So not a, not an actual grave. Um, here the Italian community gathered for a day-long feast of music, food, and fellowship. The Italian population in New London had a strong influence that brought Italian movies to the Empire Theater and live theater at the Buckley High School and the Asogachi Firehouse. More on Asogachi when I'm talking about me later. <laughs> I actually learned to box in the Oswego. Well, I, I became more proficient, I should say, at the firehouse. Um, I'm sure many will still remember Dish Day at the Empire Theater. For 10 cents, you got to see the movies and received a dish. Many parents sent their children on Monday, Dish Day, to collect the dish. The floral decorations along edges and the clapping when someone dropped a dish during the movie. Each religious holiday or festa provided the community with the entertainment, Italian band in Garibaldi Park, fireworks at the dump off Woodbridge Street, religious processions from St. Mary's Church to Garibaldi Park, carrying the Virgin Mary statue, pinned with ones, fives, and $10 bills. The fabulous wedding receptions at the Tucson Gall and friendly gatherings at the Italian Dramatic Club in the Fort Trumbull area with their fantastic dinners of macaroni and chicken. I still had those when I was going to school. The 1930s were a diff difficult time for people in the United States. A worldwide depression gripped the United States and many people could find no available work. Educated men, those with special skills, and the uneducated immigrants had a difficult time finding work of any kind. Many of the residents of Little Italy were unskilled, but hardworking laborers. The Works, the Works Progress Administration, WPA, and the Civilian Conservation Corps, CCC, provided many people in New London with honest work. Their programs provided the quote-unquote welfare for the people, whereby the government put able bodies to work. So instead of just receiving money, they, you, got, you worked. You got a job. Um, commodity stores were set up in the communities to provide those in need with basic food for the week. Few would frequent these stores. Providing for family was the responsibility of the man, man or men in the family. Pride was a strong motivation against receiving a handout. There were about two dozen boys in my age group that provided my activities, whether it was to earn money, recreation, or just hanging around. We would meet at the corner or the park and plan our activity. Usually it included buckety buck, beat the bear, kick the can, and ring Olivio. 
practically all of our games involve contact. Uh, Buckety Buck was particularly brutal, <laughs> I'll just say, uh, knowing what they did. Basketball was played like keep away. You tried to get to the basket, no ball. We, they, we had a bag stuffed with leaves and tied with a string, while the opposing team would trip, punch, kick, or jump on you to get the ball. You either passed it or tried to get it in the basket. We always needed a reserve ball. Football was also often played with a leaf stuffed bag. These activities were played at Namiog School. The rock strewn dirt at the schoolyard resulted in many scrapes and bruises. So they were playing in hard dirt with rocks, not on when they played football, not on grass. Nighttime, we usually played kick the can or ring Olivio. These games were played in the street on the corner of Shaw and Woodbridge Streets. The street light on this corner illuminated our play area, and it was protected by us because it provided the light to carry on our recreational activities at nighttime. This was my neighborhood family and the atmosphere I grew up with. The following stories are of my experience of my family from my father's arrival to the new country, his employment, marriage, family, and lastly, my own experiences. The experiences reported here are fact. However, the names of my friends and their families have been changed to avoid any embarrassment to them or their families. That's the end of chapter one. So we had kind of like a foreword uh, in the, the first video, and then chapter one is really setting all this up. And now we begin the stories. But that's next time.